Our final speaker has what I think is a very difficult task, but I'm delighted, I'm sure you're more than equal to the challenge. I'd like to announce Professor Alphonse Weber, who is from the home side, who is going to give a summary of the meeting today. Yeah, I'm not quite sure whether I will actually be up to the task, but you can judge that at the end. I want to like especially thank those people who, who stayed uh, to, to, to see uh, or to hear the final act. And it's not really a conference summary. Uh, you will see themes uh, of, of the talks that, that you have heard previously. And this is just a summary which you will have in front of your, your program. And I'll try to see, like, put together some of the things uh, we have heard today. And the first question I ask myself really is, uh, what, what's small? Do, do you know what you see here, these tiny dots? Yeah, that's the deep field view of the Hubble Space Telescope. So they're pointed, the camera, into a void of nothing for half a year. And then, at the end, they looked and what they saw, and they saw lots of galaxies there. And uh, you take one of those little dots there, and it's just another galaxy. And you know somewhere in this, not even the size of the pixel in this galaxy could be our solar system. And you know somewhere in this solar system, okay, that's maybe not quite a true representation. We have Earth and the Moon there, and also somewhere, this island. And, uh, okay, that was three years ago, when we had a little bit of slow and the country came to a halt. <laughs> uh, even Oxford, okay, didn't quite look at the time like that. And uh, here we are in this lecture theater. And, okay, I had to Photoshop myself into this. <laughs> uh, at this point, I feel pretty small. So, so what is the history of the small? It's, it's the small dots in the sky, uh, okay, looking outwards from us. I think that's uh, another entire day we can spend of that. So it, it's all a question of, of, the, of the perspective. And okay, tr more traditionally, of course, what is small is like we take, we are the measure of all things, or at least we believe that we are, and so we look down, trying to understand the world around at us and what it's made of. And that didn't start in the Renaissance, it started thousands of years ago when people were observing the skies or when they tried to observe the world around them. Uh, and we heard this morning there was this atomic model, like what the world is made of, that's almost two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, that's what we know about, and some, many of the other cultures may have had similar ideas. And of the, the, the ideas at the time were everything is made out of, and we, we heard the argument in the morning, out of the smallest thing. There must be something which is small, undivisible, and which then makes up all the stuff that we see and that is around us. And at the time, they had no idea or no really physical evidence or uh, that it should be like that, but they found it very appealing. You try to explain from some principles, some basic principles, what the world is made of. And at the time, people thought, and I don't really understand that, that everything is made up, made up by four things, water, fire, air, and earth, and even at the time, people didn't quite believe it. But anyhow, here are the four elements, and Aristotle was one of the people arguing that it should be like that. You have the earth, which is cool and heavy, so they linked the things, there's the basic things they saw around us and tried to assign it properties. There is water, the wet liquid stuff, there is fire, something hot, and there is air, and okay, if you count, there's also the earth, ether, okay, it's actually five things, but then they said the ether, which is something which is close to heaven. And then, okay, I'm not sure, that's not quite visible here, they connect, all the matter is made up out of different proportions and shapes out of these four different things. 
And uh, I, I found this, which I found quite, quite funny, is, okay, it starts quite reasonable, hard substances. So if you have atoms or basic building blocks, which are rough and prickly, they stick together, so they make a solid. If you have something which has a slippery surface, you have a liquid. Uh, and of course, then, when you smell something, then if it's a bad smell, smell and hurts your nose, that must be something prickly uh, which hits your nose. Uh, and okay, nice smells are probably something smoother, something which is nice to touch. And then, when you see, uh, which is not quite the atomic model, but they try to explain, of course, the world around them and what they observe with these things, is when you sleep, they are just like the important atoms which leave your brain. And if you die, then too many of those have left your brain. Uh, the heart is not the center of love for the old Greeks. That was the center of anger. The brain, okay, that they, at least they got right, was the center of thought. And I'm not entirely sure why the liver is the seat of desire unless you're an alcoholic. <laughs> um, okay, we know that was really not quite what our universe is, is made up. And it took many hundreds of years, as we learned, until we got <laughs> something right. And one of the people who got the atomic concept right, initially only like a mathematical concept, if you want to say, was uh, John Dalton. He said, all the things we see around us consist of individual particles, and in his atomic theory, all matter is composed of these tiny particles, and they called them atoms. And all atoms of an element are chemically identical. Yes, he got that right. Uh, but he didn't quite get it right that they all have the same mass. We now know they don't because they are different isotopes. But generally speaking, that was, was okay. A chemical compound is then a combination of those in the right ratio. So you have a 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 2 to 2, a fixed ratio of these atoms which builds up all the chemical compositions. And then chemical reactions are between those different compounds. And the way to think about that is very much like your Lego set. Uh, you have different kinds of Legos, and there are only certain ways on how you can combine them. And how did he figure that out? Or people at the time, they figured that out by really accurately measuring the weights of these things before and after the reaction. And they found that the reactions were always in proper ratios of mass. So therefore, they said, okay, there is, like when hydrogen reacts with oxygen, there was always the same mass ratio, not a little bit more, not a little bit less. And, and so the mass ratios, they then said, that's actually the ratios of the atoms. And here's what you see. And of course, now in, as, a, as, a, as a modern physicist or a modern human, uh, we think it's so obvious. Uh, why did they even have to think about it? But that's from our view today. That was a really a big jump. Uh, they measured something accurately and they tried to explain it. Um, and as a result of all this work from John Dalton and others, we got this. Do you know what this is or who this is? Yeah, that's him. And who is that? He's the guy who was a few months late. <laughs> uh, that's John Lothar Meyer. He's a German who did the same thing independently uh, for Medelev, but just a few months later. He arranged all the elements and the masses uh, that they found, the mass ratios, into a big table and then grouped them in columns of uh, of their chemical properties, and that is what we now have, and what the result is, that tells us what the world is made of, all, uh, all the atoms, and as was mentioned earlier today, this year we actually celebrate the 150 years birthday of this system. Okay, at the time it was quite a bit smaller. Uh, 
uh, it was like this top part here, it went down in some line, these elements here, the transuranium elements there are only highly unstable, uh, they can actually only be produced in, in, in the lab. And so, so the uranium here is the, uh, I say it's a stable element, uh, it's the last stable uh, natural element, all beyond that uh, they are artificially created. This one here is actually not really stable, but it has a lifetime which is almost as long as the life uh, of the universe. So, is this all really true? I haven't seen any atom, have you? So, at, or at least a hundred years ago, it was a nice mathematical tool, uh, but what people really knew were like the size of the living things. They could see us, they could see on the big scale the living things, the blue whale. Is actually the blue whale the biggest <coughs> living thing? Yeah, actually there's a fungus which is like a kilometer. Uh, maybe it has, and even the mass of that fungus is more than the mass of the blue whale. Uh, so it's not quite the biggest living thing. Uh, and they went down and they knew about the ant and the frog egg, even a human egg at the time actually you, could, you could, couldn't really see. So you needed, as we've seen this morning, uh, the microscopes really to figure out what the smaller and smaller things are. And down the atoms here, you can't actually see with a, with, a, with a light microscope, but you can actually use an electron microscope to figure out what they are. And then you see here a, a few slides from the very first kind of uh, microscopes which were uh, developed in the 1600s, uh, where people were able to make sketches because photography hasn't quite, hadn't quite been invented of the things they saw, that's a flea, and I remember when I was a kid, I put some grass in a, in a glass of water, said it sit there for a, few, for a few days, and then looked at the water, and I saw this little slipper animals in, uh, in the glass. And it was pretty much that microscope that I used as a kid, and uh, probably many of you as well. And I only learned today it was standardized uh, here in the UK. And of course, we have gone on quite a bit, and now using these electron microscopes, we can actually see the individual atoms. You can image using a beam of electrons and the reflections of this beam of electrons to really here see the individual atoms. And what, what is shown here are the gold atoms. Gold is always good, it's easy uh, to vaporize, to make very flat, thin layers. So that's one of the standard things, as we heard earlier today, that people experiment with. And yes, you have this fluorescence where we heard uh, about uh, earlier today. Okay, so when I wrote this talk, I still thought uh, that, that Feynman was one of the fathers uh, of uh, nanotechnology, which now uses all these things at the small scales and that we can't see. And he had this challenge, as we heard uh, at the APS after dinner speech, and okay, it wasn't a real challenge because it only took like a year uh, for the first motor here to be built with the dimensions that he postulated. And I found a very nice uh, letter where he agreed, uh, yeah, the challenge has been met, but it also said, I'm only slightly disappointed that no major new te technique uh, mode to be deployed to make the motor. I was sure it had a small enough that you couldn't do it directly, but you did, congratulations. Now, please don't start writing small. Uh, I've moved into a new house, I got married, I don't have the money right now. Anyhow, it, it took a bit longer until the second challenge was met uh, eventually as well. And yes, you already heard every nano science talk will have this picture and it's my favorite nano science. It just looks beautiful. And even if people didn't understand how to make this, uh, it, it just shows an incredible craftsmanship and understanding, or maybe not understanding, but at least knowing how to make beautiful things. And I'm not sure whether people actually ever drank from those or whether they're just too, uh, too precious and, and were just like something to exhibit. Uh, 
And yes, nanotechnology these days, uh, I say these days, uh, do you know what this is? white paint we use this this hundred of years the white paint has titanium dioxide which is the white color nanoparticles in that so nanotechnology is is hundreds of years old so it's not really something new but now it's used in a wide variety in energy technology and i'm not a not an expert in any of those but you have it in drug delivery systems uh, you have, as you have seen, you have this new reflective or iridescent materials. And what I really liked here uh, is a miniature Formula One car. And you can't read the sale, but this here are 10 micrometers. So it's a hundreds of a millimeter. And so this axle here is probably just like 100 nanometers, like a bit. Uh, it's incredible what people now can produce. Okay, I have to disappoint you, it's not really a car that can drive. <laughs> um, so, we have it all sorted. Atoms are what the world is made up. Uh, it has a nucleus, uh, which has protons and neutrons in it. It has the electrons, and oh yes, it's a nice picture I found. We know it's not doing orbits like we do orbits around the sun. It's a cloud of electrons, a distribution, a charge distribution around the atom. But of course, we have also heard today that this is not quite true. Because instead of having all the different atoms being the things that the world is made up of, there are actually lots of different particles uh, the quark, the up and down quark that we heard, the, the charm and strange quark, uh, and then even also the beauty quark, and none of that was asked for. Okay, the electron seems to really be a fundamental particle, but then it has uh, brothers and sisters, uh, which are a bit heavier, and then you have these neutrinos, and then you have the photon, that is okay. That's the light we see, that's the particle everybody knows. They are the force carriers of the weak interaction. Hey, there's the Higgs boson. And okay, this guy, actually nobody has seen yet and we don't really understand it. So we are not quite done yet. So how do you go further? How do you actually try to figure out what these different constituents are uh, which make our universe? Oh, it went back. So the new microscope that people used are particle beams. And we have heard like how the alpha particles are deflected by atoms and then from this concentrated charge and how these particles got deflected, we really figured out that there is a highly charged small region in the nucleus which, which, which has uh, all the positive protons sitting in there and you can use that by an alpha source or so natural sources of particle beams or you can use particle accelerators. And these particle accelerators are now, if you want, the, the new microscopes uh, in, in modern times. And so from seeing the atom and seeing the nucleus, we went even further from studying the proton and, and later on also the quarks. But let's for a moment just stay with the nucleus here. Why is it important that we understand the nucleus? It's really not any of our chemistry is, is relevant here. Uh, the nucleus is not relevant to understand, okay, except for tiny effects uh, for, for the chemistry. We can really build the universe without understanding uh, what the nucleus inside this atom is doing. But if we don't understand what this nucleus is doing and how it works, we would actually never understand why the sun produces any energy and heats up us. So it's actually quite important to understand, if you want to understand the world around you, even like this tiny thing in the center of the atom. And we use nuclear power stations to generate energy. So we need to understand this nucleus, how to split it, how to fuse it. And in these nuclear reactors, we can breed unstable elements which decay and this radio radioisotopes are actually used in medicine so what you he see here is a scintigram so this person was given and i I've, 
I've experienced the same thing. I've been given a radioactive substance to eat. Uh, it was an omelet uh, with radioactive isotopes in it, which decayed. So it was a limited amount of radiation. And then they imaged what would happen to this radioisotope. They wanted to see how fast my stomach emptied. And here you can see where biological activity, where lots of energy is produced. And you see here, uh, you, can, you can say, this, so that's the spine, there are the ribs, and there is this lump here which somehow collected this substance, uh, the, the, this substance and is used as a tracer to figure in this case, like where's lots of activity, that's probably a tumor. And so you can use this in, in areas where you otherwise can't use x-rays uh, to find out uh, where the bad things are happening in your body or actually to understand how chemical reactions are. They're used as tracers. And moving back, we wanted to not only understand how the nucleus works, that's what people did with the early particle accelerators. So you see here kind of this thing here is a magnetic field and the particles are curved and accelerated in this magnetic field and then extracted and then somewhere here they had the experiment where they then did things with their particle beam, they scattered it of material and tried to find out what the structure of the nucleus is initially and then if you bigger, build bigger and bigger machines you can even look inside the proton and the neutron and we had this exciting talk of earlier today from Rolf about the state of the art here really in particle accelerators. So what you see here is actually not a particle accelerator. That was the last time that you could look inside the Atlas experiment at CERN. That's one of the big particle accelerators and these coils here are magnetic fields which are used not only to accelerate and bend particles but also to help analyzing them. So this is how this experiment looks like and if you look carefully here is the little me, or probably not the me, but the standard human. And here you can see the, uh, the accelerator, uh, the beam, which is actually a ring of 27 kilometers. And, and then this detectors here, then you have two particles colliding in the middle of the detector, and you see all the other particles coming out. And, and by studying this debris from this collision, in the same way as was done uh, by, by finding out that there's a nucleus in the middle of the atom, you can find out uh, what the substructure in the atoms is. And here's just like an aerial picture of the LHC. It's a ring of 27 kilometers and if you want to see how big that is, that's here, Geneva Airport. And I lived here for the last year. So all this work now let us, what I call the new uh, periodic table. It has the quarks, it has the electron, muon and tau, it has the neutrinos, it has the charge carrier and it has the Higgs and we heard yes it describes everything beautifully but there are lots of things about this that we don't understand yet and so people start dreaming how can we get a better microscope. Uh, this is the LHC that I've shown you uh, 27 kilometers so maybe you want to build something even bigger and bigger means more energy. So the bigger your microscope is, the smaller the things are that you can see. Uh, or maybe build a linear collider. That's here something which people talk to build uh, in Japan. Uh, is that the way to go? We don't quite know yet. So. I don't really have a summary or a conclusion. I have something in between a summary and conclusion. Uh, I'm curious and most of us are curious. We want to know what is that made of? What is our universe made of? What are we made of? And in this quest, trying to understand all the details, microscopes help to discover cells and bacteria which have had direct influence on our life and health, even on materials. The development of the atomic table, the periodic table of elements, really led us to understand chemistry. Thomson's discovery of the electron, okay, that's quite simplistic. We now have electronics. We need to understand how electric charge works and propagates through materials. 
Without electronics, I couldn't even give this talk. Or I could give the talk, but I couldn't show you any slides. Uh, understanding the nucleon, the nucleus inside the atom, has had huge implica implications for power generation and for medicine and for many other things. Understanding and manipulating the small, the nanotechnology, I've shown just a few slides and the previous speaker knew much more about it, had really is, is influencing all bits uh, of our life in, in ways and will, will even do more in, in the future. And to sum this up, there was a lot of progress. I have no idea where this will all lead and, and how our, our future will develop and how small is small and what things are important and we'll find when trying to dig deeper or try to understand things better.